So the next organ system we're going to go through a little bit is the kidneys. So let's go ahead and start taking a look. Some of the clinical reasons you may want to take a look at the kidneys are they may have symptoms of flank pain or hematuria, they may be in kidney failure, or maybe you're concerned about a complicated urinary tract infection. Far and away, the most common diagnosis or findings that we're going to be looking for are signs of obstruction. Uh, we may see some other things that we'll talk about a little bit, but obstruction and hydronephrosis are the main things that we're going to try to identify with point-of-care ultrasound. So I'm just going to throw in a few facts about renal colic, and this is mostly for our emergency department folks. CT rarely changes management. CT increases cost. CT is time-consuming and can slow down your busy department. And CTs are associated with ionizing radiation. Now, I know we have lower radiation doses, but still, that stuff is cumulative. So these are my facts about CT and renal colic. And part of why using point-of-care ultrasound, this has been demonstrated in the literature, can decrease our use of CT scans for renal colic and flank pain patients without having a negative impact on patient outcomes. So a little bit about the imaging technique. This is mostly on the right side. It's about the mid-axillary line at the xiphoid level. Indicator is at about 11 o'clock, and then we just sweep anterior to posterior to examine the kidney entirely. On the left side, it's a little higher, a little more posterior. Indicator is at about 1 or even probably closer to 2 o'clock. And then we're, gonna, again, going to sweep anterior to posterior. Sometimes we may use deep breaths to help us get the kidney in view and identify the kidneys in their entirety on each side. The renal exam should always include the bladder as well. We'll throw that in here momentarily. So we want to identify the kidneys. We fully examine them. We don't just take one picture. We fan through anterior to posterior, examine them completely, and we use some rotation of the probe to get us between the ribs. Sometimes we may have the patient take deep breaths to identify the kidneys themselves. The notable anatomy is the capsule, the cortex, the renal pelvis, and the pyramids. So let's just go through those a little bit. So the capsule is the bright white outline. That's Grota's fascia that outlines the kidney. Then within, we're going to see the darker external renal cortex. The bright white in the middle is the renal sinus and renal pelvis. In some patients, we may be able to identify a normal kind of small caliber ureter. Uh, however, the ureter is not usually going to be visible in most of our patients, so don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to look for it. And in some patients, not all patients, we may see these teardropped renal pyramids that sit external to the renal pelvis. So take a note, they don't have any real visible walls around them and they look like little teardrops and they're external to the renal pelvis. So those are the renal pyramids and those may be, some patients you don't really see them at all and some patients they may be more prominent. They're often more prominent in younger patients and children as well. So that's some of the structures. So in the kidney, when there's hydronephrosis, fluid is gonna be black and the fluid is gonna push into the renal pelvis and dilate the renal pelvis. So this is probably mild hydronephrosis that's dilating the renal pelvis, and you can see it's outlined by this bright white tissue in the renal pelvis itself. Here's just another example where we see the renal pelvis dilated with fluid, urine. So these are cases of hydronephrosis, and this is gonna be one of the main findings we're looking for pretty much any time we're doing renal ultrasound. A few other just findings that may come up that you just want to recognize so you know what they are. This is polycystic kidney. Hopefully you knew this before you started to scan this patient, but it happens where you don't. So this is what a polycystic kidney may look like. And remember this may be associated with simple cysts and other organs like liver and spleen. And in this patient we actually see pretty significant renal atrophy where we see renal pelvis and hardly any renal cortex at all. Uh, again, hopefully this is not a surprise. Hopefully we know this patient has chronic kidney disease, but you may look for or, or identify findings like this in patients with renal atrophy. Sometimes the kidney is so atrophied that it can be hard to even identify in the proper location at all. So those are some findings. Again, hopefully not surprises, but Surprises happen sometimes, and you want to recognize them and know what they are. Now, another finding, now this may come up more in a trauma setting, is a renal hematoma. So here, if we see kind of loss of that normal parenchymal appearance of the kidney, there's this round shape, and if we look, there's no blood flow within that area. This is a renal hematoma. 
Now this would have to be interpreted in the right context. This could, in another context, this could be just a renal mass. There are also some normal findings that can mimic this, but this is another way you can use this in maybe a trauma setting or other findings. Probably gonna end up following this up with uh, other cross-sectional imaging. But again, primary finding we're gonna be looking for in most cases for all these indications is hydronephrosis. And fluid is going to look black. Here's what hydronephrosis may look like. It may get, there may be different grades. It may push out and dilate all the way to thinning the renal cortex. Just an example here, fluid within the renal pelvis. Here's an example, this is a pretty mild case. And then all of these examinations, anytime we're, we're worried about the kidneys, we should always look at both kidneys and the bladder as well. It doesn't take that long and gives us a little bit better information. Comparing sides is always useful. So here's what the bladder is usually gonna look like. If it's massively distended, that might be a clue that they've got an outlet obstruction and that's why they have hydronephrosis. Um, or if it's empty, maybe not. So this is the bladder. And then on a rare occasion, we may even identify stones at the bladder neck. So here's an example of a stone at the bladder neck, which can take our diagnosis from suggestive or speculative to a definitive diagnosis. And certainly obviates the need for CT at all in this patient. So a couple things about the kidneys and hydronephrosis and, and interpreting these findings, uh, specifically in patients with flank pain. We use all of our initial tools, history and physical, the urinalysis and ultrasound to evaluate whether they've got ureterolithiasis or not. Remember, everyone with a stone does not have hydronephrosis and everyone with hydronephrosis doesn't necessarily have a stone. It's possible there are other reasons for their obstruction. So just interpret within the clinical context and make your decisions with all the information you have. But with renal ultrasound incorporated, you can be more selective with your CT scans and limit them to patients where the diagnosis is still not felt to be clear based on the HMP, the urine, and the ultrasound, uh, if their symptoms have gone on for a long time, or they've got other complications going on, signs of renal failure, they look sick, there's signs of infection, where you wanna get more detailed information about the size and location of a potential stone. So those are some of the thoughts to think through, and we'll bring this back to some of the cases we talked about. So this is case four, our three-year-old female with a fever and a urinary infection. I always like to look at the kidneys in these patients because if they've got signs of obstruction, they are gonna require a more aggressive treatment, uh, possibly even hospital admission. Whereas if they've got no signs of obstruction and they otherwise look pretty well, that's a patient that you can be more comfortable treating as an outpatient and doing other outpatient workup as needed. In this case, this is their right kidney, and they've got severe obstruction. Their kidney is not really even identifiable because it's so dilated and obstructed due to congenital hydronephrosis. This is a patient who, at the very least, is going to get a longer course of antibiotics, very detailed outpatient follow-up, maybe a urology referral, and depending on how the patient looks and the whole scenario, maybe a hospital admission for IV antibiotics. This is not a patient who just gets you know, five days of antibiotic and goes home. So significantly can change the care in these pediatric patients with febrile urinary infections, or even adults with possible complicated urinary infections. So next case, so our case number five, a 36 year old with acute flank pain. They've got right-sided flank pain, it's acute. The clinical syndrome is very consistent with kidney stone. They've got hydronephrosis, so that increases the likelihood that this is kidney stone. They've got some red cells in their urine. Even if this is their first presentation, I would be comfortable not doing a CT on this patient and withholding it if they come back later with further symptoms or problems. Some would argue if it's their first presentation that maybe you need a definitive diagnosis of CT. I don't necessarily feel that way. That's uh, There's not great science to, to guide us there. But seeing hydronephrosis in a patient that has the right clinical scenario for a kidney stone adds weight to that diagnosis and probably negates the utility of a CT scan in that case. And I'll often just tell these patients, if your symptoms aren't improving, you may need to return and we may think about doing a CT scan at that time. But most of these patients 90% or so of kidney stone patients, treatment is symptomatic and expectant only. So here's just a quick proposed algorithm, not completely evidence-based validated, but extrapolated from the available evidence that you suspect ureteral stones, do history, physical, urine, and ultrasound, 
Uh, maybe you're going to do CBC lights, that kind of thing with their creatinine. If it's consistent with stone and you feel pretty confident that this is renal colic from kidney stone and they don't have big complications and their symptoms haven't been going on terribly long, then you really just manage their symptoms, educate them on reasons for follow-up, and most of the time they're going to pass these on their own and that's all they're going to need. If they don't pass them or they have prolonged symptoms later on, you can always do the CT scan later. Uh, if you're not feeling comfortable, this doesn't really sound like stone or I, the diagnosis is still in doubt, then maybe do a CT scan. And if you're in, truly in doubt about stone, then maybe you need to do contrast to look for other complications like abscess or psoas abscess or some other findings. Or if it's consistent with stone, but they have signs of complication clinically or with lab work, or their symptoms have gone on more than, say, a week, then maybe they need a CT scan as well to further define size, location of stone, because they're more likely to be intervention candidate for kidney stone. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that you can employ algorithms like this to help you be more selective on your CT scans to cut down ionizing radiation, cuts down costs, and helps you manage your department and your patient flow a little more efficiently. And then our last case... We see patients like this in the emergency department in the hospital setting all the time that are admitted with an acute kidney injury. One of the first things to do always is to exclude obstruction, right? So we can do this in about a minute and a half at the bedside by just doing a quick scan of their kidneys and their bladder and confirming that there is no hydronephrosis and their bladder is not hugely distended. So we can quickly get obstructive uropathy off of our list or quickly rule it in which will change the whole management of that patient quite significantly. So incorporating renal ultrasound early in the care of our AKI patients can help shorten our differential and expedite care. Those are the main scenarios where renal ultrasound is useful. So a complicated UTI or suspected complicated UTI, renal colic, and in the workup of acute kidney injury. Let's just look at kidneys in a little more detail for a second. You good right there. Uh, I might have your big breath for me. So kidney, bright white capsule, darker renal cortex, bright white renal pelvis. Sometimes renal pyramids are visible. Again, just noting the spine posteriorly stops at the diaphragm. You can relax. On this side, we see the right kidney. Uh, a little bit of big, big breath for me. And again, bright white capsule, darker cortex, renal pelvis. It's almost the same echo texture as the liver. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the bladder. So bladder is always a little lower than you think it's going to be. So we fan, we get right above the pubic symphysis, fan towards the feet. Here's the bladder. It's not a circle. It's kind of a trigonal shape. And as we fan towards the patient's head in the female, we see the uterus. In this case, we see a small amount of free fluid, which is normal behind it, but that's where we look for free fluid in like a trauma setting. And in this case, we can see left ovary. sure I can see right over here. It's probably sitting there. And just a sagittal view. We see bladder in front, uterus, posterior cul-de-sac with a small amount of normal physiologic free fluid. All right, just the difference of the bladder and the male versus the female. So again, we're looking for the bladder just above the pubic symphysis. 
take note that the bladder is not a circle. And in the male, we can see there's prostate sitting back there. As we fan up, then we shouldn't see really much else. Summarizing, so we've talked about several things. We've talked about looking for intra-abdominal fluid or bleeding. We've talked about looking at biliary tract pathology. We've talked about looking for abdominal aortic aneurysm and even maybe ruling in aortic dissection but not ruling out. So I hope with some of those things together you can see where point of care ultrasound early in the workup of abdominal and retroperitoneal problems can help us expedite care, decrease our cognitive load, and kind of direct our further steps in management more efficiently. As always, we are going to apply our findings in the whole clinical picture and the clinical context. None of these things exist in isolation. We should be able to get earlier and more accurate diagnoses more quickly, help decrease our cognitive load to help us manage our attention on the more critical things that are needed in managing our set of inpatient group of patients or our emergency department, help us expedite care and put resources more focused where they are needed and when they are needed more quickly. So that's all I've got for you here on abdominal point of care ultrasound for now. There will be a more advanced abdominal point of care ultrasound coming in the near future, so tune in for that. Thanks for your time, and I'll talk to you all soon.